If everybody would take their seats, we're just about ready to begin. Okay, we're going to start because we have to get out of here so those who are going on the boat trip can do so. So, good morning. It's my honor to present our next speaker. As Jim and I were uh, compiling and editing our 50th reunion yearbook, one of the most striking elements of the entries was the impact that Bowdoin faculty and staff made on so many of us in our four years here and beyond. As a high school teacher for 40 years, I have had the pleasure of seeing 30 plus of my own main students follow my route to Bowdoin and to return or to report on their positive experiences here. It is most gratifying to know that the excellence in faculty scholarship and teaching continues unabated on campus today. Professor Andrew Rudlevich has been the Thomas Brackett Reed Professor of Government here at Bowdoin since 2012. Andy writes frequently on executive power and national politics for the Washington Post, the Monkey Gage blog, and is a creator of Founding Principles, a series of videos on American government and civics that is available on the Bowdoin website and also at PBS. His books include Managing the President's Program, Presidential Leadership and Legislative uh, Policy Formulation, which won the National Neustadt Prize, The New Im Imperial Presidency. He co-authored a textbook, The Politics of the Presidency, a series of co-edited volumes on recent presidents, most recently The Obama Legacy, which will be at a bookstore near you this month, and the forthcoming executive order and executive branch. Andy has a BA from the University of Chicago and both a master's degree and a PhD from Harvard University, that other college down the road. Uh, in a former life, he was a city councilor and a Senate staffer in his native Massachusetts and now lives here in Brunswick. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andy Rudlevich. <clears throat> Thanks. Oh. Many thanks for that uh, introduction, and uh, many thanks to all of you uh, for coming out on one of our uh, non-rainy days here in the month of May in Maine. Uh, uh, greetings and welcome to the class of 1969 and to anybody else who snuck in here. And uh, I'm very uh, happy to be able to join you and talk about uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is interbranch relations, uh, focusing uh, today in our, our brief time together on some of the ways in which Congress uh, seeks to oversee and uh, at times to uh, discipline the executive branch. Obviously this is uh, sort of ripped from the headline stuff as it turns out uh, and we can certainly talk about that. My, uh, my thought here is to uh, talk at you kind of rapidly for 15 or 20 minutes and then to open things up for the rest of our time for questions, conversation, discussion, uh, whatever's on your mind. Uh, we start from the, uh, the broad premise, though. Uh, Woodrow Wilson laid out, uh, coming up 130 years ago now, uh, that oversight of administration is a pretty crucial function of the legislative branch. Right? Congress is Article I in the Constitution. It, it's built to be a more powerful branch in many ways than Article II, the presidency. And that is important when we're thinking about the ways in which modern government works. Uh, over the course of American history, uh, the growth of the executive branch, the growth of the administrative state, uh, has been a, an important fact of American political development. Uh, it, it has good causes and bad causes. Uh, the good causes being that we are in a much more complex, uh, interlinked international society than we certainly were in 1788 uh, on the other hand, right, to the extent that Congress has failed to uh, live up to its own institutional prerogatives uh, and has failed to 
do its own job in trying to govern uh, this complicated nation, uh, we should be more concerned about that. But let's circle back through to that point. Right? Now, presidents themselves right, are not always very happy about congressional oversight. Uh, Robert Gates, uh, who of course served in multiple administrations, uh, testified before Congress many times, uh, talked about how Congress in the abstract, yeah, it's great, we should want congressional uh, oversight, we should want them to be involved, uh, but in fact, uh, Congress, he said, is best viewed from a distance. Uh, the further, the better, from the point of view of the executive branch. Uh, put rather more uh, directly uh, would be the, uh, the feelings of the current uh, occupant of the Oval Office. Uh, President Trump has tweeted 19 times since November 2018 about, uh, well, this very topic. <laughs> These are all different dates. Um, the first one actually starts uh, on November 12th, just a few days after the election, when he argued that the uh, decline in the stock market, uh, which occurred at the end of 2018, as you may recall, 18, not a great year for the markets overall, uh, wound up, uh, it was, should be blamed on the fact that the uh, Democrats had taken control of the House of Representatives in the election the week before. Uh, but the idea of presidential harassment, right, while uh, I'm not sure it's been phrased that way uh, by prior presidents, certainly they felt that way, uh, and their preferred uh, view of Congress is sort of like this, uh, with a big white flag in front of it. Uh, this is a cartoonist's rendering of the 110th Congress. This is uh, under President George W. Bush, uh, who people felt uh, managed to push Congress around quite a bit. And again, presidents think that's pretty good, right? Um, on the other hand, right, we have lots of examples in history. Uh, the famous Watergate uh, hearings led by Senator Sam Irving. Uh, Irvin, sorry, let me see if I have a... Uh -huh. Senator Irvin, Howard Baker, you'll recall. Uh, Herm Talmadge of Georgia, Daniel Lukaku of Hawaii, uh, Sam Dash, the counsel of the committee in the middle there. Uh, of course, this is five years, well, four years, actually, after you graduated from Bowdoin in the summer of 1973. Uh, but there are certainly more recent examples uh, when the Benghazi, uh, the attacks on the Benghazi consulate in September 2012 uh, were uh, detailed in uh, um, multiple committee investigations uh, after 2012 all the way up through 2016. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, of course, on the hot seat there. Uh, and more recently uh, with Michael Cohen, a former lawyer for the Trump Organization, uh, called before the House Oversight Committee uh, just this year. Right? So these are the kinds of high-profile cases we often see. Uh, but Congress has lots of other powers as well, right? There's, in fact, a manual of congressional oversight created by the Congressional Research Service, updated periodically. It's 149 pages long uh, and goes through a number of mechanisms by which Congress can try to find out what's happening in the executive branch, right? They have various possible tools, uh, but basically what they're looking for is oversight of bureaucratic implementation, Right? Uh, there's a, a famous uh, article in political science that talks about police patrols and fire alarms. Right? Police patrols is uh, what it sounds like. Congress right, gets in their squad car or they wander around in uh, pairs around the streets of Washington looking for bureaucrats behaving badly. Right? You know, sneaking a smoke on the back steps, right? uh, running an illicit dice game out of the back of the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, and then they're caught right, by this uh, sort of proactive investigation and brought to heel. Uh, fire alarms, uh, slightly more subtle, right? Mostly Congress doesn't have the time to be wandering around the, uh, these back stairs of the departments, uh, so they rely on others to look for them, right? And so they wind up with a, uh, someone else, a constituent perhaps, or an interest group, uh, maybe a journalist, Right, to sort of find out what's going on in an agency and, and pull that alarm, at which point the members of Congress right, rush out of bed and go down the fire pole and rush to a committee room and start holding hearings. Right? So either way, right, uh, you have the ability of members of Congress to try to find out what's happening w with regard to the laws that they passed. Right? Remember, uh, 
agencies act on uh, behalf of legislation that's been passed by Congress and funded by Congress, as that third bullet point points out as well. Uh, Congress can change the structure of an agency. It can change the way in which an agency acts, what is the process by which a particular policy is carried out, and of course it can demand reports on a regular basis from those agencies, either in person or in writing. Uh, and while it's true that those reports often pile up unread, often they do become the basis for later legislative action. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, for example, was written about in a multitude of reports uh, that, uh, that got much more attention, of course, after the September 11th, 2001 attacks. Uh, so the oversight of what is going on in the bureaucracy is one issue. Another is simply informational hearings, right? What kind of things should we legislate on? What kind of problems are out there in the world? What kind of approach could we take? And of course, these can veer into investigations, right? A sort of more aggressive form of information gathering uh, with an idea towards future legislation. Uh, and Congress does have various powers to back up those demands for information through subpoenas, even the role of contempt of Congress. Uh, now the president has some power to resist this, right? We can talk a little more about executive privilege, if you'd like, uh, and what parts of the pile of information that comes into the White House that might protect legitimately. But of course, uh, the courts will also have something to say about that as it moves through. Uh, budget authorizations, as I mentioned, right? Congress's one job, really, every year is to pass a budget. Uh, you'll have noted this is a job that carries out pathetically poorly in recent years. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as they write their budget language, they can shift the way in which people in the executive branch act. And they can prevent them from acting in some ways, incent them to act in other ways. Uh, that is one of the key powers of Congress, the power of the purse. And of course, they have sort of the nuclear weapon of the oversight arsenal which is impeachment, though we might also mention censure. Uh, it's nothing, that hasn't been used against a president since 1834 in Andrew Jackson, uh, but remains a possibility. It was discussed during the Clinton impeachment. Uh, and Congress has a role actually in the 25th Amendment process of uh, declaring that a president is unable to serve in office. Right? That is something that is <clears throat> pushed forward by uh, the cabinet and the vice president uh, but if the president disagrees with their assessment, the actual judge of that, of the president's fitness in office, is actually in Congress. Uh, so a little bit parallel, though separate from the impeachment process. So uh, I'm going to talk about all of these briefly, but largely just to, again, to note, the courts over time have been pretty sympathetic to Congress's ability to get information out of the executive branch. Uh, a little longer cite from Woodrow Wilson's 1885 book on congressional government, right? Noting that uh, they need to have every means of acquainting themselves with the act and disposition of the administrative agencies of the government, otherwise the country remains in crippling, embarrassing ignorance, right? The informing function of Congress, he wrote, should be preferred even to its legislative function. Um, that was quoted uh, approvingly by the Supreme Court in the 1950s. Uh, a famous case in 1927 uh, during the Teapot Dome prosecutions, as the Congress sought to get information about how the Interior Department in that case had corruptly sold oil leases uh, to uh, energy interests, uh, keeping a uh, large share of the profits for themselves, right? Uh, McGrain v. Doherty case, the court held an actual legislative practice, power to secure needed information by such means, has long been treated as an attribute of the power to legislate. So while Wilson sort of separates the informative function and the legislative function, the court mostly has treated those as the same thing. And if you followed the two rulings uh, in the last couple weeks on uh, President Trump's efforts to block subpoenas from Congress, uh, both of those judges uh, more or less took that point of view, right? That Congress has the ability to get information for the purpose of legislating, even if it's not obvious that, they, that their real intent is to legislate, right? There can be political uh, winds torn up in this. Uh, in an investigative sense, right, Congress bounces back and forth, and this is from a uh, 
a book by Doug Kreiner and Eric Schickler, uh, Kreiner's at Cornell, uh, uh, on congressional investigation. And you can see that uh, they actually went through the congressional record day by day since 1898 up to 2014 to look at how many days of investigative hearings happened in a given year. Uh, obviously, it could be more than 365 if there's more than one committee having a hearing on the same day. Uh, but you do see these peaks, right? And they kind of follow uh, the parts of history you might expect. Uh, again, this early peak for Teapot Dome, uh, the Truman investigations during World War II about uh, World War II uh, armament contracts mostly, uh, Estes Kefauver uh, looking at organized crime in the 50s, the national commitments arguments about the Vietnam War in the later 60s, and of course Watergate, right? This big block here in the 70s, uh, tailing off somewhat with a peak again for Iran-Contra in the 80s, uh, and then in the 90s, uh, looking at Bill Clinton's Whitewater scandal. Uh, you will note, though, that the number of days of hearings goes down quite sharply. Even during this period, a lot of the uh, Clinton investigation, of course, was outsourced to the independent counsel of that time, uh, not done by Congress itself. And you do see, generally, right, these big peaks have, have shrunk, even for things that are relatively intense as we move forward, right? Abu Ghraib, the uh, accusations of torture in Iraq, right, got much less legislative attention by this measure uh, than did earlier uh, charges of administrative uh, malfeasance. Uh, and of course, if you look at some recent things, uh, the charges that the IRS uh, had uh, treated some nonprofits unequally as it decided whether they had uh, tax exempt status under the Obama administration, of course, Benghazi, and more recently, though not on this chart, uh, Russian investigation, uh, the investigation rather of uh, potential Russian intervention in the 2016 election. Um, and so they argue, uh, these authors, right, that Congress can make a difference to policy uh, even when they can't legislate very effectively. And of course, in today's polarized political world, Congress finds it hard to legislate affirmatively. Uh, so their question, in a sense, was, well, does that mean Congress is useless? Not just sort of in a tweet kind of fashion, right? If you read Twitter, Congress is definitely useless. But if you, you know, look at the scholarship, they argue that there are mechanisms for Congress to change administrative behavior even without legislation, right? And that investigation, information gathering is an important part of that, right? They say that they can make uh, direct changes right, by threatening, perhaps, to shift a budget of an agency or to forbid a certain behavior, right? President Obama's efforts to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay uh, was prevented by a budget rider that said that no money could be appropriated for that purpose. Uh, they could have sort of an informal or a secondary kind of effect as presidents looking to other policy areas that they want to move in decide that it would be better to appease Congress on this issue uh, and save their powder for another day. Uh, more directly, investigations do have an effect, these authors found, on presidential approval ratings. Uh, now remember, this is only up to 2014. Uh, President Trump's approval ratings have not moved at all, really, since January 2017, so it'll be an interesting test of their thesis. Uh, but, right, generally they find that all else equal, right, you see the days of misconduct hearings lowering presidential approval right, by as much as five points as you get into a couple of months of hearings, right? which is not a, you know, a dramatic effect. The first day will, will crush a president's ability to act, uh, but over time can have a cumulative effect. And given a relatively narrow range of presidential approval ratings generally, right, rarely do we have very high values, except in extraordinary circumstances, after the 9-11 attacks, for example. Rarely do we have hugely low values, uh, though sometimes, uh, but a lot of hovering sort of in the 40s and low 50s these days. Uh, and so being able to have a five percentage point shift can be important. So investigations can matter. Uh, now, as I said, we should talk a little bit about the, the filthy, disgusting word uh, that's been uttered in congressional circuses. I had to update this presentation last night to, um, just to keep up with things. And uh, 
So it is worth just a sort of reminder again, uh, I suspected conversation might flow this way, so I thought I'd preempt it just slightly. Um, but President Trump, obviously, this is the way he feels about this particular I word, right? Uh, he felt slightly different when it was this one, or I don't know about this one, right? As you'll guess, this is not a, uh, a rare call in American politics generally, right? In fact, there were calls, and the Philadelphia newspapers called for the impeachment of George Washington. You might be interested to know. There's actually a, uh, impeachment movements against John Adams. There's actually a vote to impeach Thomas Jefferson, which got one positive vote, granted. Right? It was 141 to 1 or something like that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, right, early presidents and throughout American history, you might remember uh, uh, Harry Truman, right? His firing of Douglas MacArthur in the uh, Korean War led to actually pretty widespread calls for his impeachment at the time until uh, more investigation of General MacArthur's behavior uh, became widely known. So impeachment is not a, a rarity. Impeachment talk is not a rarity, I should say, in American history. Uh, the actual process of impeachment has been much rarer, certainly in a, a serious way, and I wouldn't count the, the Jefferson effort in that direction. Um, what does the Constitution actually say? Right? We're becoming increasingly familiar with this. Right? The president shall be removed from office uh, for treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. I want to uh, just insist, uh, as I do in my classes, that uh, you don't use the word impeachment loosely to also include removal from office. Those are two different things in the Constitution. Somebody can be impeached, obviously, and not removed from office. Uh, impeachment happens in the House by majority vote. Removal from office, by contrast, requires the Senate to weigh in and to vote by a two-thirds majority to remove the president from office. And, by the way, other executive officers as well, right? There have been uh, judges removed from office uh, via the impeachment and removal process. Uh, occasionally, an impeachment uh, brought against uh, cabinet officials as well, though in uh, one of the more recent cases, uh, which is actually in the Grant administration, so not all that recent, right, was uh, the member of the cabinet resigned uh, rather than be removed from office. Uh, so this process, right, is a, uh, one that lends itself to some vagary, right? What is a high crime and misdemeanor, after all? Um, Alexander Hamilton wrote about this in Federal 65, uh, seeking, obviously, as he did in all of his Federalist papers, to defend the Constitution and the way that the framers of the Constitution had worked out this balance. Uh, there were a lot of arguments during the Constitutional Convention about who should be the court of impeachment. James Madison actually thought it should be the Supreme Court. Um, There's a lot of nervousness that having Congress handle impeachment would make the president too subservient to Congress. Right? The idea that a uh, majority or a supermajority in Congress would be able to take out basically any president that they didn't like. Uh, and that remains potentially an issue. Hamilton wanted to be clear that impeachment should not be about personal matters. It should not be about your policy differences with a given president. It should be about the misconduct of public men, as he put it, the abuse or violation of some public trust. High crimes and misdemeanors uh, are different from the kinds of crimes that you might get brought up on in court, right? Obviously, a, a criminal act, i.e. against the criminal code, could lead to impeachment, but he wanted to argue that that was not uh, necessary and sufficient for impeachment, right? You needed to have the possibility that a political crime, as he puts it, injuries done to the society itself, uh, could be plausible uh, grounds for impeachment. So, Mr. Trump, do you have a question? Yes, Mr. Trump from New York weighs in in 2014. Are you allowed to impeach a president for gross incompetence? Um, and the basic answer, at least from the constitutional record, is not really, um, right? In fact, uh, worried about sort of what uh, high crimes and misdemeanors might mean, uh, George Mason, who was at the Constitutional Convention, said, well, maybe it should be, uh, you should allow impeachment for maladministration, he said. Uh, there was some debate about this, and the, uh, the collected framers decided maladministration was too vague, right? It should not be, again, about your differences with the president on policy, 
right, which obviously leads very quickly to your decision that the president is grossly incompetent, right, very fine line in political debate between your, somebody doing something you don't like and that person being evil or incompetent. Uh, that was as true in the 18th century as it is today. So they dropped the idea of maladministration. That was rejected flat out uh, in the, again, the vague phrase, high crimes and misdemeanors included. That said, right, Gerald Ford, um, before he was vice president and then of course president, uh, mentioned uh, during the Republican effort to impeach Justice William O. Douglas in 1970. Uh, now remember, Ford is the minority leader of the House at this time. Uh, this effort wasn't really going anywhere. Uh, but he pointed out, probably accurately in a sense, that the only honest answer to what is an impeachable offense is that an impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House of Representatives considers it to be at a given moment in history, right? Which is a, uh, a formulation that's been written off as uh, sort of opportunistic. Um, it's certainly technically accurate, right? But it does lead one into thinking that political wins in a way that Hamilton would have objected to can be uh, the basis for impeachment. Um, so, Again, we've only got a couple of impeachment examples, and I just want to sort of note what they were for, right, in the past, right? Andrew Johnson, of course, in 1868, during Reconstruction, massive arguments with the uh, so-called radical Republicans who had a large majority in both houses of Congress, right? <clears throat> Johnson uh, was disliked so much by the Republicans in Congress that he was actually impeached before there were any articles of impeachment, right? Uh, they voted to impeach him, and then a week later, they came up with some reasons why. Um, and those were based on uh, what was called the Tenure of Office Act, mostly. Uh, Congress had, well, they were very uh, distrustful of Johnson. Um, they did not like his approach to Reconstruction. Uh, they pointed out, uh, accurately it has to be said, that he was a white supremacist. Uh, and they argued that he should not be in control of personnel, right? That Congress had to be able to step in. And so uh, the Tenure of Office Act required that the Senate approve any removal of cabinet officers. So when Johnson fires Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, uh, that is judged as an impeachable offense, a high misdemeanor in office, said the Articles of Impeachment. He also violated another pretty constitutionally dubious law that moved the ultimate commander-in-chief power to the general of the army, right? Not in the presidency itself, General Grant, it happened to be, the general of the army, and of course a, a reliable political ally of the Republicans in Congress was able to, uh, you know, under this law, actually had to sign off on any orders to the armed forces. Again, of dubious constitutionality. Um, but the charge was that Johnson, even if he disagreed with the law, nonetheless had to execute it. Uh, when Johnson failed to obey these laws, he probably expected uh, to be brought to court, right? To find out whether these laws were in fact unconstitutional, uh, instead he was impeached. Uh, I will note one other article, uh, and this was approved uh, by the House, though ignored by the Senate largely, um, and basically it argued that the president had made fun of Congress, right? That President, unmindful of the high duties of his office and the dignity and proprieties thereof and of the harmony and courtesies which exist, ought to be maintained between the executive and legislative branches, did attempt to bring into disgrace, ridicule, hatred, contempt, and reproach the Congress of the United States. Right? So. Why would that <laughs> yeah, this is 1868. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you can imagine that these guys would have really hated social media. Uh, the entirety of the internet, I think, is actually doing just this, right? So there is, uh, you know, a, a certain thin skin involved here, and as I say, the Senate didn't take it particularly seriously, but it was an interesting effort to argue that uh, the president could be impeached for his rhetoric, right? Again, this was rejected, and as you know, probably Johnson was acquitted uh, he was not removed from office. He was certainly weakened politically, even more than he had been, uh, by the process. Uh, but he was ultimately uh, found not guilty of these charges, remained in office, though he did not 
wind up getting nominated for re-election uh, in the election of 1868. Um, well, fast forward, it's actually 100 years uh, until the next serious impeachment. I mentioned Truman. That never came to much uh, in the end, despite the wide-scale uh, furor again immediately after his uh, firing of General MacArthur. Uh, but you'll remember, perhaps, right, some of the, uh, the greatest hits of the Watergate era. I will play one for you just because I just finished my Watergate class here and it's kind of fun. If we can get it to play. You probably have an ad, I apologize at the beginning. Maybe not. Nope. Oh, that's not playing up there. It's on my screen. No, you'll have to listen. So, yeah, one of the greatest uh, pregnant pauses in Oval Office history, perhaps, right? We need a million dollars over the next two years. We could get that. <laughs> um, and, of course, this in the end is one of the uh, planks of the object obstruction of justice charges against President Nixon and others in the White House, right? The use of hush money to the Watergate burglars, uh, offers of potential pardons or clemency, uh, but straight out cash, uh, much of which had come from uh, corporate sources actually during the 1972 campaign, uh, funneled into cash, into uh, safes in the White House, safes in the uh, Committee to Reelect the President's offices, right? If you remember all the President's men, you'll remember some of this. Uh, and then funneled in strange ways to the Watergate burglars. Uh, when Howard Hunt's wife died in a plane accident, they found cash scattered across the ca crash site that she was carrying uh, in her bag. Um, in any case, uh, obstruction of justice uh, via bribery, via witness tampering effectively, uh, but also, of course, the famous smoking gun tape uh, of 1972, uh, where the president directed uh, his aides to bring the CIA into the White House and to have the CIA tell the FBI not to investigate this case. Don't get any further into this period, he said. And of course, it's when that tape is finally released in the uh, aftermath of the U.S. v. Nixon Supreme Court case in July 1974 that President Nixon's uh, authority basically falls away completely. Uh, he's basically told by the Senate, you'll remember a famous trip to the White House by Barry Goldwater, Hugh Scott, and others, uh, to tell him that he would no longer have uh, the votes to sustain uh, an acquittal in the Senate after the inevitable House impeachment. Um, which, again, was on not just that count. There was also uh, arguments about the abuse of power, right? The use of government agencies inappropriately, including the FBI and the CIA but also uh, the IRS and other government agencies uh, using the power of the government to uh, take aim at people on the so-called enemies list, or actually enemies lists, depending on which part of the White House you were in. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, interestingly, failure to provide the impeachment inquiry with the information it wanted, including the White House tapes. Uh, that, of course, wound up having to go to the Supreme Court rather than being provided by the president. Uh, there were a couple, though, that were not adopted. Uh, one dealing with the president's uh, alleged tax fraud. Right? He had taken a, an overly large deduction for the donation of his vice presidential papers uh, to the government. And this, it was felt, was a crime, but it was a private crime. Right? It didn't meet Hamilton's definition of a crime against the state. Right? It was something you could go to jail for. In the end, he was fined. Right? But it wasn't something that was impeachable. Likewise, the, uh, the secret bombing of Cambodia, Operation Menu, right? that led, of course, to massive dis domestic disruption when it was uncovered, including the Kent State and Jackson State shootings. Uh, but uh, again, the committee felt that uh, given congressional acquiescence broadly to the war in Southeast Asia, uh, this wasn't something the president could be impeached for. It was you know, not something they agreed with, but it was at least a, a rational extension of the president's Article II powers as commander in chief, uh, given the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and budgetary appropriations for the war over time. Um, of course, Nixon wound up resigning rather than to go through with the impeachment process left office on, <clears throat> excuse me, August 9th, 1974. Um, again, 25 years later, we fast forward to Bill Clinton. Uh, take me a long time to tell the Bill Clinton story, though it's a pretty good story. Uh, nonetheless, ultimately, right, out of a variety of strands that had to do with this real estate deal in Arkansas back in the 70s, uh, with his alleged encounter with a woman named Paula Jones in an Arkansas hotel room, in the 90s, and of course with his affair with Monica Lewinsky uh, in the later 1990s, uh, President Clinton wound up uh, having four articles of impeachment passed in the Judiciary Committee against him following a lengthy uh, investigation by the Office of Independent Counsel, uh, then led by Ken Starr. Right? This was uh, done by, uh, again, uh, a law that came out of the Watergate era Right? The Ethics and Government Act created this Office of Independent Counsel. Uh, it was used in the 1980s to investigate the Reagan administration and Iran-Contra, uh, drawing the ire of Republicans. It was used in the 90s to investigate Bill Clinton, drawing the ire of Democrats, and it was allowed to expire in 1999. So we no longer have an Office of Independent Counsel. We have special prosecutors who are appointed under rather different circumstances to investigate specific accusations. Uh, in this case, there were arguments that the president had perjured himself both to the Office of the Independent Counsel and earlier in a deposition about the Paula Jones sexual harassment case, uh, that he too had obstructed justice by coaching witnesses or allegedly promising jobs to witnesses if they didn't talk to the Independent Counsel, notably, again, Ms. Lewinsky. Uh, and then also for abuse of power, uh, obstructing the investigation of the judiciary, uh, not taking seriously the questions that they sent to him to answer and the like. Right. In the end, uh, two of those were passed by the full House, uh, one of the perjury counts and the obstruction of justice count. Right. But of course, President Clinton did take his case to the Senate uh, and was acquitted. Neither of those counts got a majority of the Senate, much less the two-thirds required for his removal from office. And so that's become sort of the, the standards sort of the, of a, an impeachment pushed forward, it is argued, right, for uh, partisan reasons uh, and one that was bound to fail. Um, so currently, right, of course, these are sort of ripped from the headlines moments. Uh, there are a lot of legal questions lurking beneath the argument right now, right? Some of them have to do with the president's efforts to prevent Congress from getting information, right? Others have to do with presidential powers themselves, right? how to define terms like collusion or obstruction of justice. Uh, big picture questions, like whether the president's actions as president can be criminal, right? If the president fires the head of the FBI, for example, that is something that the president has the authority to do, right? The president can pardon people, right? We don't know, actually, in law whether the president can pardon himself. That's an unanswered question. Uh, but the president certainly has a pretty unchecked pardon power in Article II of the Constitution. Uh, 
right? Can using those powers, which are presidential powers, uh, be criminal? If not, can they be impeachable offenses, right? Can a sitting president be indicted, right? That's been a big part of the debate recently. Uh, the Department of Justice says no. In 1973, they argued that, in fact, a sitting president could not be indicted, that the proper remedy for criminal behavior by a president was impeachment, removal from office, and then, if necessary, criminal charges. Right? Not all lawyers agree with this. In fact, Leon Jaworski, uh, who was the uh, second of the special prosecutors uh, uh, investigating Richard Nixon, argued strenuously that this was an incorrect reading of the law, but nonetheless it is Department of Justice policy, and we've seen that reflected in the way uh, in which uh, Bob Mueller's report uh, deals with the question of criminal charges, arguing that it did not have, that he did not have, under Justice Department guidelines, the ability to raise those points. So all of these questions come around, right? President Trump uh, the other day, um, you know, argued, right, that there are no crimes, so you can't impeach. Again, historically, that's not been the case. Uh, it is certainly feasible that there could be things done that were not in the criminal code, but which nonetheless were impeachable offenses. Um, but it does remain a, a, certainly a question for members of Congress looking forward, right? Ultimately, all of this is a political question, uh, and it's really there that you need to begin, not necessarily end, but certainly begin there, when you're thinking not only about the exercise of presidential power vis-a-vis -vis Congress, but also Congress's power uh, to investigate, to oversee, uh, to gather information on the behavior of the president. So I'm going to leave it there for the moment and uh, welcome your questions and conversation at this point. Thanks. Now, I don't know, Skip, if you want to be the MC here, but, uh, or I can do it. or I see one in the back here. I'll try to repeat it if... Uh, Okay, here. Uh, I am not a mental health professional, and so uh, I am... Uh, I barely, uh, you know, I'm not sure what mental health I retain, actually, after the last 10 years or so. But, uh, um, but yes, uh, it's an interesting question, right? And it's one that, uh, um, you know, the American uh, like the Psychological Association and others have tried to deal with. Uh, you know, there was a, a little uh, boomlet in, um, really, in the 1970s, uh, James uh, David Barber's book, The Presidential Character it became one of the big books in uh, presidential research, and that was effectively driven by psychobiography. Right? It was efforts to, you know, how did this president relate to his father and his mother and all that, right? And it sort of lost favor, uh, partly because it was so idiosyncratic, right? It all depended on uh, a president's background, but also in how you interpreted that background and came to, again, uh, nearly all of the people working in that field had never met the president in person, certainly had not been in a position to diagnose him uh, in any serious way. Uh, so I have to say I remain pretty skeptical. I actually think uh, that uh, gag order is a good idea. Uh, I mean, that's not going to stop people from thinking generally about the kinds of traits you would want to see in a president, uh, but I'm pretty uh, cautious, I think, about going down the road of you know, what actually, uh, you know, in a diagnostic sense, uh, to recommend, uh, you know. Well, I mean, the, uh, whatever you want to say about President Trump is not subtle. And so, uh, to the degree, you know, those personal, in fact, there was an article in The Atlantic, uh, you might have seen this, or uh, I think it was before the, he was elected, out the psychological case, and it did say he's a narcissist by agnostic standards, but he hadn't met him. It's one of the more thoughtful takes, I think, on this, but still suffer the, uh, the failings that all that kind of literature has. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's two questions here, right? Is, and then when that cascades into unfitness for office, first a question for the voters. It could become, in theory, a question for cabinet. I've heard, you know, at least side, uh, some of them, you know, sort of search.